So let me introduce again Andrew Hamilton with the continuation of his talk about supergeometric algebra as the language of physics. Thank you again. You know, get another helping of me, I'm afraid to say. I am an astrophysicist, been for a long time, and it kind of affects how I think about things. I'm not really interested in fundamental physics. I'm very interested in what happens inside black holes, and that forces me to engage in what happens fundamentally in physics, and especially at high energies beyond those accessible to human beings. You're seeing a, the same visualization that I showed you this morning. So I'm interested in high energy physics to try and solve problems in black holes where the energies are more extreme than anywhere else in the universe. My guiding philosophy as an astrophysicist has always been, what is nature really doing? And if I look around at nature, I can see that all matter, leptons and quarks, is made of spinners. You and I are made of spinners, spin half particles. And I also see in the standard model that all interactions, all the forces of nature, arise from symmetries of spinners. The standard model is the product of three groups, U1 cross SU2 cross SU3, hypercharged, weak isospin and color groups. And general relativity is also based on two groups, the Lorentz group product with the translation group. So that says to me that spinners are kind of at the heart of nature. And the third thing is spinners have the smallest spin, spin half, non-trivial spin half, so a non-trivial spin. What is the, what is the supergeometric al algebra? The supergeometric algebra consists of complex linear combinations of spinners, column spinners, row spinners, and their inner and outer products. This conference, this workshop, is about the geometric algebra. And it was proved by Brouwer and Wilde in 1935 that the algebra of outer products of spinners is isomorphic to the geometric algebra of multivectors. And that is true in arbitrary dimensions. This is an outer product of a column spinner and a row spinner. It makes a matrix. You can also take the product of a row spinner with a column spinner and get an inner product, which is a scalar. But at least in the laws of matrices, you can't multiply a row spinner by a row spinner, and you can't multiply a, a column spinner by a column spinner. And so it turns out that the Supergeometric algebra not only contains the geometric algebra by taking out of products, but it also contains the exclusion principle. You can't put, you can't, <laughs> the, those products where row cross row is forbidden and column cross column is forbidden look very much like the rules for creation and annihilation operators. And one can in fact show that the algebra of those things is identical. One of the things I want to emphasize is that the index of a spinner in n space-time dimensions is a bit code with n over two bits. That seems to me quite fundamental. The reason why the multivector algebras are, are products of two when you add up all the multivectors is they arise as a, a, an outer product of uh, the, the spinner algebras. So let's remind ourselves for, of, of some familiar spinner examples. I guess I've started off with saying a vector in n space-time dimensions is indexed by a Cartesian index. I learned about Cartesian vectors in high school, and it was really an eye-opener for me to realize that I no longer needed to any geometry at all. I could throw away my geometry textbook and replace it by algebra and do proofs way more quickly. And I wondered why anybody had ever bothered to teach me uh, algebra, I'm sorry, geometry. I think it ought to be taught in high school that spinners also have a, a beautiful structure, which is to me even more beautiful, which is that they're indexed by a bit code with n over two bits, and they have two to the n over two complex dimensions. For example, a Pauli spinner, which is the GM, it's that's the spinner part of the geometric algebra in two or three dimensions. It has one bit, and the bits of a, a Pauli spinner can be either up or down, something that's quite familiar. The algebra of outer products of Pauli spinners yields the geometric algebra, 
in two or three dimensions. In four dimensions, we live in three plus one space-time dirac One has a Dirac spinner introduced by Dirac, which is a, essentially a relativistic version of a Pauli space uh, a Pauli spinner. It has four over two equals two bits and four complex components. And its basis spinners consist of up, up, down, down, up, down, and down, up. And these two bits consist of a boost bit, which aligns with the direction of motion of the spinner and a spin bit. And if you form, okay, if you have a, a, the boost and the spin bits are aligned, it's called right-handed. If they're anti-aligned, the Dirac spinner is called left-handed. And an electron is a Dirac spinner. And I find it fascinating that something as fundamental as an electron contains the structure of space-time within itself. So how do you about, go about constructing these things? <sighs> Spinners would live naturally in an even number of dimensions. So what you do is you take an even number of dimensions, you, you parcel the two n basis vectors into n pairs, and those, those vectors I've labeled gamma, A plus or minus, which comes from Dirac gamma matrices. And then you, when you pair them, you can form, com, form these complex combinations. These are chiral vectors, right-handed or left-handed. Each orthonormal pair defines a complex chiral vector. So a complex structure, which is essential to quantum mechanics, is actually built into the get-go in the supergeometric algebra or in spinners in general. And the way it works is that if you've got two dimensions, you know, this is one of the pair, and you rotate in that plane, it'll rotate a chiral vector by e to the i phi, plus or minus. And if you take a spinner, they can be either spin up or spin down, spin half, and they rotate by, by half that phase, e to the plus or minus i phi over two. If you are in odd dimensions instead of even dimensions, the standard thing that one does is one projects the odd spin algebra into one dimension lower by identifying the odd dimensional pseudoscalar with a phase factor times the unit matrix. For example, the Pauli pseudoscalar, we routinely call the Pauli vector sigmas, their product is set equal to the imaginary times the unit matrix. Spin 10 was first noticed in 1975 by Georgi and independently by Fritsch and Minkowski. And it remains today a, the viable grand unified group that unites the three forces of the standard model. It contains the, there were three grand unified groups, SU5, then the Panty Salam group, and then Spin 10, which contains them all. So Spin 10 is the granddaddy of grand unified groups. Physicists tend to call it SO10. It's actually the covering group of SO10. That's the group of rotations, orth of orthogonal rotations in 10 dimensions. The group is actually spin 10 because it acts as it's a symmetries of spinners. Spin 10 has five bits, 10 over two equals five bits and 32 basis spinners. And this was something that was pointed out by Wilczek in 1998. So for example, an electron, it, there's a Dirac electron has four components. It's got a right-handed, a left-handed, and particle and antiparticle parts. And, and here are its bits. It's got two weak bits and three color bits. And all the leptons and quarks of a generation have five bits going up or down, making two to, two to the five equals 32 spinners. I've drawn a little diagram of what they are with the red, green and blue dimensions being the RGB the color bits of the strong force. And then the other two I've got, a, I've labeled them Y and Z. So Wilczek didn't notice this, maybe because he didn't write it down in the right way. But if you write down all the spinners in a table organized by the number of up bits, you get this table, this is uh, the first column is zero up bits, then one up bit, two up bits, three, four, five up bits. 
you can see various familiar things, a neutrino, the electron, and up and down quarks, complete with various colors in the case of quarks. There's various striking things that should hit you between the eye on this. One of those facts is that the spin 10 chirality coincides with direct chirality. Direct chirality is something to do with, with the Lorentz group, whether the spin and boost bits are aligned or anti-aligned. And it happens to coincide with spin 10 chirality. Spin 10 chirality counts whether the number of spin 10 up bits is even or odd. You can see zero, all left-handed, one, all right-handed, two, all left-handed, and so on. Is this a coincidence? Does it have to be? It didn't have to be. In fact, it's a relationship between two algebras, the Dirac algebra. It's a, it's a the chirality is, is really the sign of the chiral operator or the pseudoscalar. The Dirac pseudoscalar is the product of the four Dirac vectors. The spin 10 pseudoscalar is the product of the spin 10 vectors. Two completely different algebras, if you believe what the physicists say about the Dirac algebras and the spin 10 algebras being distinct. But here you have an equality of two things. So that suggests that the algebras are related and not distinct as, as commonly assumed. The other thing is that standard model transformations are all a subgroup of SU5 and SU5 is a subgroup, that subgroup of spin 10 that preserves the number of up bits. Each of these columns is an SU5 multiplet. So standard model transformations can transform you vertically, but not horizontally. And if you look at the electron, for example, which you're used to say, well, that's, those are related by Lorentz transformations. Those are arrayed horizontally. So standard model, vertical, Lorentz transformations, horizontal. Again, it's saying, saying I'm part of the same thing. And fi one final comment that if you look carefully, you see that the, here's the right-handed neutrino uh, electron, left-handed electron. They differ by a flip of the Y bit. And it turns out that electroweak symmetry breaking, which is a breaking of the hypercharge and weak forces into the electromagnetic force. I've said adding a time dimension is potentially capable of unifying the Dirac algebra and the spin 10 algebra, which contains the standard model. But you have to do a lot of work to make that happen. In order to make it consistent with physics as we know it, it's necessary that the Dirac and, and standard model algebras be commuting subalgebras of the spin 11-1 geometric algebra. That's the Coleman-Mandula theorem. The Coleman-Mandula theorem essentially says you can only combine an internal algebra with the Poincaré algebra if you do it in a trivial fashion. Well, that's not quite what it says. That's the physicist's version of the theorem. The theorem actually says, can I interrupt you one more time? Yes. Can you go back in and um, hide the... Uh... No, I can't. That doesn't give you the option here? No, Let's we, we tried that. Recording. It's still recording. We just can see the... Uh... I know uh, it's because I'm running Linux and it doesn't, okay. Zoom hasn't implemented that yet. <laughs> okay. The Coma-Mandula theorem simply requires that if you have an internal algebra and a, and a geometry of space time, those must be commuting subalgebras of the unified algebra that you come up with. If in fact the grand unified algebra is spin 11 one, then all internal dimensions are spatial, are, are space time dimensions, there's 12 of them. And so the coleman mandula theorem is satisfied trivially. The relation that you end up with, these are the four vectors of the Dirac algebra expressed in terms of spin 11 one vectors. I've got the six bits, I've drawn them T, gold, Y, silver, Z bronze, and then RGB, the color bits. And that is the, this is the algebra that, that, that you get. And you find out that the inner products and Lie algebra of these Dirac vectors defined in terms of the spin 11-1 vectors are precisely those of the Dirac algebra. Moreover, the Dirac algebra and spin 11-1 geometric algebra satisfy, automatically satisfy all the discrete symmetries that they must because spin 11-1 differs from spin 3-1 by 
8, which is the Bott periodicity theorem. So the conclusion is the four forces of nature unify in the spin 11-1 geometric algebra. And no, you have not heard this idea before, and yes, this is an original to respond to the referee complaining that was this an original idea or not? Yes, it is. So it's interesting, once you've added a T bit, this extra time bit, it adds extra fields which happen to behave like some of the fields that we already know. In particular, the electroweak Higgs field is built into the spin 11 algebra. It, you take one of the two time dimensions, this is actually the spatial dimension associated with the time direction, make a bivector out that, of that with the weak vectors, and you get four things whose algebra is precisely that of the Weinberg electroweak multiplet. The electroweak Higgs field itself is this particular one of that set of four, and it carries one unit of, of Y charge, and it breaks Y symmetry, and it gives fermions their mass by flipping their y, y bits, completely consistent with the standard model, essentially without doing anything. The Higgs field that breaks the grand unified spin 10 symmetry turns out to be the product of the, the bivector product of the time vector and its spatial companion. And that turns out to, it carries one unit of T charge and is able to give the right-handed neutrino a Majorana mass by flipping their T-bit. Only the right-handed neutrino is allowed to do that because only it has no standard model charge. And that's nice because the right-handed neutrino really needs, uh, if you give it a mass, it solves the, through the seesaw mechanism, it, it solves the problem of where neutrino masses come from. This is a very specific model. There are basically almost no free parameters. And amongst other things, you can see what additional groups before spin 11-1, the, the, uh, the electro, the standard model group unifies to. And it turns out that spin 11-1, between spin 11-1 and the standard model, there is a single possible group, which is the Patti Salam group, spin four cross spin six, and it unifies where this particular combination of coupling parameters is equal to one. And that turns out from the running of the coupling parameters to be about four times 10 to the 11 GeV. And that's simply not negotiable. So there has to be another level of symmetry breaking to spin four across spin six of four times 10 to the 11 G. It's not negotiable. Grand unification occurs where after that first unification then occurs where the weak and color groups two left are unify, and that happens at three times 10 to the 14 GeV. You don't need supersymmetry. You don't need to fine tune the three coupling parameters. They automatically unify first one, and then the other one. And here's a, a list of predictions. And are there any ones that I need to say? I'll mention the two at the end. Grand unification is mediated by a Majorana mass a Higgs field. The Majorana mass Higgs field is available to drive cosmological inflation at the grand unified scale. And that's a non-trivial statement. This is a single field, which is consistent with the data from the Planck. And there is the only evidence for a, for a dark matter particle is a light scalar with vanishing standard model charge. So the scalar companion of a photon or a, a Z boson. And then there's some non-predictions. I don't know what causes the three generations. I don't know what causes the masses of fundamental fermions and so on. Okay, this morning I talked about the DNA of the universe. The complicated DNA of earthly life is a language written with four letters, T, A, C, and G. Lenny Susskind has proposed that the complicated DNA of the universe is included in the labyrinthal convolutions of the folded up dimensions and the stringy fields that coil them. I must have been writing that late at night. And if the present work is correct, then the letters of the DNA of our universe are the six bits, T, Y, Z, R, G, and B. Thank you. And are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Anthony Lazenby here. So uh, this looks very interesting. Um, in terms of um, predictions, are you saying that you can predict that electroweak forces effectively only operate on the, the left sector, not the right sector, things of that kind? Does that come in? 
I, I don't know whether that's a prediction. It's part of Spin 10, which is one of the ingredients I start off with. Yes, but I, I haven't seen... Uh, okay, it's fine that it, it appears to work, but how does it explain that sim asymmetry? How does that come about when you haven't put that in to start with? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not God. I, I didn't design the universe. I, as I say, I'm an astrophysicist. I, I look at the ingredients that we have and what we seem to have as a standard model, which unifies in spin 10, that seems to be the granny unified group. And then if you want to combine that with general relativity, you're stuck with combining that with the Dirac group, oh, sorry, the Dirac algebra. And that to my complete amazement hasn't been explored before. So I thought I would explore it. And the answer is it works out and it works out very elegantly. As to what I can say about electroweak symmetry breaking is that the electroweak Higgs field is sitting there in the spin 11-1 algebra without it having to be invented. If you look at papers in the recent years, even this year on grand unification in, in SO10 as they like to call it, the, the, they routinely talk about, here's my assumption about the Higgs fields. And in this particular case, there aren't any assumptions about Higgs fields. The Higgs fields turn out to be, they have to be part of the algebra, spin 11 and one. They're the scalar part of the algebra. They're, so it's bivectors with which are Lorentz scalars. That's what they have to be. And that fits. Okay, uh, perhaps I'm asking something that can't be answered here, but it seems to be a priori, you would have a symmetry in such a theory in an enveloping Clifford algebra between left and right. And in the same way that you get a Higgs, which you know trips uh, left into right, you would have one that goes right to left and so on. Now, why is that symmetry not present? That's what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it comes from is that spin 10 breaks down into spin four cross spin six. And spin four is a direct product of SU2s, two SU2s. So there's an SU2 left-handed and an SU2 right-handed. And if those have two different couplings, they behave as two different forces. That seems to be true in, in our universe today. So that's the way it is. And it fits, okay. I don't have to do anything to make it work. Yeah, you, you, you might have thought there should be a symmetry between right and left-handed, but there isn't. Thanks, Andrew. Yes. Thanks, Andrew. Can, can I... Can I... Okay, I'm going to go back to the prediction slide. Okay. Can, I, can I ask a question about the way the, the Lorentz group kind of fitted in, the way space-time kind of yeah. dropped out? Because I think you were saying that the spatial vectors were actually five vectors in your uh, in your sort of 111 algebra. Yes. But the time-like is still a vector in the 111 algebra. That's correct. That, that seems to break Lorentz invariance that, that you, you seem to have pulled out as a preferred direction of time. And, well, you, you might have thought so, but this satisfies exactly the, the Dirac algebra and the Lorentz invariance that you require. And the Higgs fields, in addition, that you bring in also satisfy Lorentz invariance. So it may not look to you like that, but the algebra, the mathematics, is precisely that. Because the, the, your Lorentz transformations are then going to be mixing grade one and grade five up in your 12 dimensional space. Correct, yes. And the, <laughs> the Lorentz group is products of these, and it turns out that they are all six dimensional vectors. So those at least all have the same grade. All the bivectors have grade six, but the, the time vectors does seem to be special here. And it, again, I, I refuse to take any responsibility for this. <laughs> this is mathematics. This is the conclusion. Take it or leave it. Just a, a quick question. So among the non-predictions, what causes the three generations of fermions? Now that sounds like a pretty big problem to the setup. Do you have space for that? No, I don't have any space for that. And the thing you should know about the generations, the three generations of fermions, uh, 
but only one generation of, Burmia, uh, of, of bosons. So if there is a symmetry that connects generations, it's not a gauge symmetry and should not be part of the gauge group. If there were, there would, there would be additional bosonic symmetries associated with it. My own suspicion about where those three generations come from, since they, they're identical in their gauge properties, as you know, but, uh, but they differ in their, their masses. And if the string theorists are, are right that the spectrum of masses arises from excitations of the internal dimensions, something like that would be consistent with what I'm showing today. So that's what I think. You're appealing to string theory. I, I love string theory. It, wow. it, it tells me there's a multiverse and there's a DNA that allows the universe to reproduce. I'm a big fan of string theory. Okay. <laughs> you want me to criticize it? I can do that. <laughs>